Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sean Lynch, and it's my pleasure to be uh, hosting this event for you today. We'll be discussing uh, the moral responsibility of intellectuals. Our panelists for today are Jim Franklin and Peter Slezak. And it's also my pleasure to introduce my friend, Paul Fortune, who will be moderating today's event. So, uh, I recently started reading uh, Friedrich Nietzsche's book, Human All Too Human, and he prefaced uh, it with uh, the following quote. If it's good enough for, for him, it's good enough for me. Okay. For a time, I reviewed the various occupations of men in this life, trying to choose out the best, and without wishing to say anything of the employment of others. I thought that I could not do better than continue in the one in which I found myself engaged. That is to say, in occupying my whole life, in cultivating my reason, and in advancing as much as possible the knowledge of the truth in accordance with the method which I had prescribed myself. I had tasted so much satisfaction since beginning to use this method that I did not believe that anything sweeter or more innocent could be found in this life. Every day I discovered by its means something uh, new which seemed to me sufficiently important and not at all familiar to other men, the joy which I had so filled my soul that all else seemed of no account. Rene Descartes. All right. Um, hello. Welcome to the School of Mathematics and Statistics. Uh, thanks to them for allowing us to let this discussion take place here. Um, as Sean said, we've got Peter and Jim with, it here, with us here today to talk about the uh, what is the moral responsibility of intellectuals. So, um, Peter, if you'd like to do your opening statement. Thanks very much. Thanks everybody for coming along. Um, I'll make a quick summary of some of the things I want to say because inevitably I run out of time and I may not get to the punchline key ideas. Um, in fact, a lot of what I want to say is quoting some of my favourite authors on this that have made the points very eloquently. But the key ideas are, are two. Uh, of course, for intellectuals, it goes without saying that our responsibility is to tell the truth and perhaps further than that to uh, uncover falsehoods and lies, which is also uh, relevant and important. But there's another important aspect of this which surprisingly is very controversial, and uh, it, it should be a truism, but it, it seems that most people, most intellectuals, don't uh, observe it. And what I'm referring to is not all truths are equally relevant to all audiences. And I've had this conversation with a lot of my friends that to describe as intellectuals, sophisticated writers and academics. And the point here, and I should immediately, inevitably give credit, as I do, to the person who's made most of this point, and inevitably, perhaps as my students will know, only five minutes, and I mentioned Chomsky's name. Um, <laughs> Chomsky spent his whole uh, career, apart from his linguistics, on exactly this point and the points I'm making, and I'll refer to him later as the most eloquent on this. But his point is that there are truths that are relevant which have to do with your audience. And uh, intellectuals generally, to sum this up briefly, uh, prefer to talk about the crimes of other people for which they have no responsibility, for which they can't do anything. And the relevant truths are the ones, morally speaking, are the ones for which you're responsible, or for which your group is responsible, and for where your voice can make a difference and have some effect. That seems to be so obvious as to not require argument, but in fact, if you look at the way in which intellectuals behave, they behave in exactly the opposite. And again, in the time we have, I perhaps can't give you too many examples, but uh, I can certainly cite plenty. And as I say, Chomsky's entire career has been devoted to that. And of course, that's the reason he's so, on the one hand, loved, uh, on the other hand, was revered. But to the extent that he's unpopular and hated is because he rubs intellectuals' noses into their failure to observe this moral responsibility. His most famous papers uh, on this topic just talk off the top of my head for a moment, um, uh, go back to the 60s during the Vietnam War, where he wrote papers with these topics uh, titled The Responsibility of Intellectuals, the Responsibility of Schools, meaning Universities, in a Time of Crisis. And so he spent a lot of his time uh, spelling this out in detail. So uh, let me begin a bit more systematically. Um, I find from my colleagues, it's not that well known, but there's a kind of a locus classicus for this topic, uh, written by a Frenchman, Julien Bondat, in 1927 called The Treason of Intellectuals. And so there is a literature that sets out exactly this kind of idea. Um, and his book, as the title suggests, in French is La Treason des Clercs. And the clerics were not just church people, but it's translated now as intellectuals. Um, and particularly, uh, it focuses on the issue that I'm interested in, which is a political one. It's our relationship to nationalism 
and to patriotism and our, our uh, love of our state and what our responsibilities may be in that regard. Um, let me just begin more systematically by I was going to mention uh, a rather nice lead-in, which is a quote from Albert Einstein. I noticed there's a poster out there that says something cute about mathematics. If you think you've got problems, you should see my problems, which is rather cute. But he also said other things that are rather uh, relevant here. He says, uh, he was once asked how he'd reached his revolutionary insights, and he answered it was by asking questions that children are told not to ask. And of course, that's rather interesting about our education, and I'll refer to that, and how we and in intellectuals see their role and how education tends to reinforce what I think are the wrong lessons. Um, and Bertrand Russell made a similar point, predictably, as a dissident and, and also much reviled intellectual uh, for his political activism. Um, he said, a certain percentage of children have the habit of thinking, and one of the aims of education is to cure them of this habit, which is a typically cute insight into the idea that education perhaps isn't as we at the university think it is. Uh, I've got several remarks that are uh, in that vein. Um, the idea is that the more educated you are, the more indoctrinated you are. Now, of course, to all of us, most of us, that's a slightly surprising and perhaps uh, unwelcome uh, insight, and perhaps implausible. Yeah. Uh, in this audience, we're not likely to find that uh, likely. But again, uh, let me quote from Chomsky. He says, far from creating independent thinkers, schools, meaning universities, have always throughout history played an institutional role in systems of control and coercion. And once you're educated, you've already been socialized in ways that support the power structure which in turn rewards you immensely. Again, out of order from my notes, I, I think I better say something that's very important here, is that I have a paper I've written I should mention in case you're interested in following it up, which is exactly on this topic about some of our leading intellectuals and how they betray their responsibilities uh, in the service of their patriotic or nationalist uh, sentiments. But they're interesting because they're some of the leading lights who pride themselves on their enlightenment values and their objective scholarship. I'm thinking of the so-called New Atheists, um, Hitchens, Dawkins, uh, Sam Harris, and even Daniel Dennett. Now, I admire uh, most of them for their work in other respects. Daniel Dennett is one of the most uh, eminent philosophers in my area. But he's part of this so-called New Atheists, and I think they're guilty. And I've written a paper, uh, interestingly titled, uh, Gods of the State. Uh, that's a reference to Socrates, of course, and I'll perhaps get a chance to mention Jim's book called uh, uh, Corrupting the Youth, which is the other Socratic uh, theme. Now, of course, uh, I haven't got time to go into any of this debate specifically with Jim, but I should mention here, Jim thinks that Socrates is guilty of corrupting youth, where it's usually meant ironically. And my view, and I share in this with uh, Chomsky's view, if we do our job properly, we should be corrupting youth. If education is done properly, it should be subversive. And it should be uh, designed to help you to think critically about the official doctrines, the gods of the state. That's what education should do, and it doesn't, according to Chomsky and me. And let me quote Orwell. Um, the same point was made by him in a very interesting essay, which we read in a class that I'm just running this semester, every semester actually. And we read Orwell's 1945 essay on nationalism. It's very powerful. It's written in 1945. And I'll just say a few things that he says. He says, it's, I think, true to say that the intelligentsia had been more wrong about the progress of the war at that time than the common people. He contrasts the smart, educated people with the ordinary folks. And he says that they were more swayed by partisan feeling. And then he makes a remark, I'm always quoting. He says, one has to belong to the intelligentsia to believe things like that. No ordinary man could be such a fool. In other words, some ideas are so stupid, only the educated and the intelligent people could take them seriously. Now, that's cute, but I think it's real and serious. And so spelling that out is important and the reasons for it. He wrote in another essay, which is not well known, it was actually, everybody's read, or most people read uh, Animal Farm, but there was a preface to it which was suppressed by the Ministry of Defence, and it was discovered not that long ago, and is now in a Penguin edition, and you can find it. What's rather interesting about that, Orwell is typically understood as having been critical of the totalitarian regime, you know, 1984 and so on, and um, actually his interests were other than that, and much more relevant and I think more important. He, in this preface, he's actually writing about the British system where we have a free press and we don't have a totalitarian government. And the question then is, to what extent we are then victims of a propaganda system which is more subtle than the brutal force applied by a totalitarian regime? Again, that's been Chomsky's theme. He talks about the manufacture of consent and propaganda or, or thought control 
in a free press. That's the more interesting issue for us, and that's where I think we get a lot of insight by reading the examples of that. So Orwell says, the servility with which the greater part of the intelligentsia have swallowed and repeated propaganda would be quite astounding if it were not that they have behaved similarly on several earlier occasions. And this is the key. He says, unpopular ideas can be silenced and inconvenient facts kept in the dark without the need for any official ban, without the need for the threat of force. There are more subtle ways, and that's the key to our society and the way the intellectual class operate. It's not that they lie. It's rather interesting. It's not mostly the cases that I'm talking about, and I'll perhaps spell out why I've picked on Dawkins and Hitchens and Harris. They're uh, critical of Islam, and you know, we're at war with Islam and so on. I think it's all right. Um, but what's interesting about that is, an interesting question psychologically, I don't think they're lying. It's worse than that. They kind of have internalized a certain framework and a certain model, but what they say is, is uh, egregiously contrary to the facts. In fact, again, if I could anticipate a point I wanted to make later, here's a question I often pose. They're against religion of all sorts. Of course, it's really an excuse to beat up Islam, but they're against all religions. But, but I've developed a kind of a, a sympathy in a way, although I'm an atheist, I have to say, in case you don't know, I'm, I share their atheism. But here's a question, which is worse? Believing things for which there's not much evidence, which I think is the case with God, or believing things, even sincerely, for which there is overwhelming evidence to the contrary that you know about. That's a really interesting category, and I think they're guilty of that. When you, again, if you read my article, I just refer you to that. I tried to document the extent to which they know what's going on in the world. How can they write such stuff which is egregiously contrary to what they know are, the, let's say, the causes of, of terror in the world and who's committing most of the crimes against humanity and so on. Um, again, we, we started off and we probably said she was on the right and I'm on the left here. Perhaps he doesn't agree with me, perhaps some of you don't. But that's at least a point of view that I think needs to be looked at seriously and the evidence for it. So, let me perhaps, how are we going for time? I've got an idea, I forgot to turn my time on. You've got 12 minutes, Andrew. Oh, okay, so I better find out. Okay, I'll think of winding up. Well, look, I was going to mention Socrates. Let me jump straight to Socrates. Um, in fact, this whole outlook has a rather interesting and venerable history. Uh, I'll make two points. I'll make Socrates, I'll make another point to conclude. Uh, in Plato's Republic, Socrates admonishes his interlocutor, one of the sophists, Calicles. He says, I've noticed that we have something in common. He says, we're both lovers. In this case, homosexual lovers. Besides the person I love, I'm also in love with philosophy, whereas besides your lover, you're in love with the state of Athens. This is rather interesting, the idea that it's a kind of a, a, a parallel either. He says, now I've noticed that despite all your cleverness, you're unable to contradict any assertion made by your beloved. This is a rather interesting metaphor. And my claim is that these contemporary intellectuals are guilty of the same kind of blind, uh, in fact, I, another article I've written uh, makes it compared to not just to a kind of a love, but to a faith. It's rather ironic that the uh, atheists, I think, are guilty of the faith of state worship. That's also a well-known idea, the, the doctrine of secular religions. There's a whole literature about that. Usually it's communism and Nazism. But that idea can be applied, I think, to these people who are uncritical in the way the Calipers is. Um, uh, Hannah Arendt was accused of, of not having enough love for the Jewish people in Ahabat Israel. And she answered rather nicely. She said, of course, no, I don't have any love. It's not a collective matter. I have only love for people, individual people. There's a whole literature on this. So finally, let me just make two more points. One of the key moral issues here is that in our society, I mean, Hitchens and Dawkins and Harris, they congratulate each other for their great courage in speaking out. But this is a joke. In our society, it takes no courage to criticize other people. And intellectuals regard that as their moral duty to criticize, whether it was the Russians or the Chinese or the whoever, the North Koreans. North Koreans. The relevant, to go back to my earlier point, the relevant moral criticism, however bad they are, it's not to excuse or exculpate uh, the crimes of other people, but to make, to go back to my original point, the point is the crimes that our government is responsible for. Unless you think they're saintly and don't do anything wrong, there's plenty of things for us to criticize. And uh, the, the penalties for honesty and integrity are so limited, of course people will be angry with you, but compared to, and this is the relevant moral comparison, the courage it would have taken for a dissident in the Soviet Union or in Nazi Germany to speak out was serious because they would have had your brains blown out. So what's the penalty we pay in this society for criticizing the crimes of our government or our people? Uh, that's the moral question that is, I think, the serious one we have to face. <laughs>
says that intellectuals should speak out if and only if they know what they're talking about. <laughs> the record is not good. Let me give you Paul Johnson's book Intellectuals from a couple of decades ago. He looks at the uh, record of some of the most famous intellectuals who advised humanity and what they ought to be doing in the last few centuries. Rousseau, Marx, Tolstoy, Bertrand Russell, Sartre and some others. He asks these questions about them. Uh, it's time to in particular, I want to focus on the moral and judgmental credentials of intellectuals to tell mankind how to conduct itself. How do they run their own lives? With what degree of rectitude do they behave to family, friends and associates? Were they just in their sexual and financial dealings? Did they tell or write the truth? And how their system stood up to the test of time and practice? You can see from his tone of voice that the answer is going to be negative in uh, all those cases, and with good reason. Uh, this is a very unfair book. Look, it's, it's true that worst results only are shown, and uh, still they are a warning to us. Well, actually the worst results aren't shown because he leaves out the uh, most dangerous intellectual war. Uh, Lenin is not there. His advice on how to run society was taken, and he ended up with uh, maybe 50 million dead or maybe 100 million if you count Mao's efforts. But actually we've got an expert on that here, Martin, giving an estimate of how many lives would have been saved if Lenin had fallen under a train at the Finland station. There were others there. <laughs> well, uh, yes, but uh, probably there would have been substantial. Nobody else quite had his uh, leadership skills. What do you reckon? No, I think that uh, Trotsky said that. He said if Lenin had fallen under a train. There would have been others. Well, that's no excuse. No, no, he said what you said. Uh, yes, uh, yes, he would have. Uh, yes, okay, well what would you say was the number of deaths resulting? I can't tell. I mean, there are all those estimates. There are all those. Yeah, yeah okay. It's hard, hard to get right to the nearest uh, 20 million or so. <laughs> but, uh, it's not good, it's not good, is it? Uh, of course, there are some intellectuals whose advice has had a good impact of society. Although their names escape me at the moment. Maybe you can tell me in the question time who are your favourites. Of course, there are genuine experts uh, giving their advice on how to build buildings, deal with viruses and so on, uh, but I think that's not we're, what we're talking about in, when we talk about the role of intellectuals. Uh, but what I see from intellectuals in comments in the conversation and the like, no need to name names, is all the moral vanity of an Oscar's acceptance speech. They're in safe positions, as uh, Peter rightly says. Uh, and they think of themselves as speaking truth to power, but it's easy. Of course, I make an exception for someone like that professor of constitutional law in Beijing who says that the PRC should abide by the rule of law. He's taking a serious risk. Let me quote from an intellectual who did attain some self-knowledge later in life. A certain Reverend Hugh Howweiss, an Anglican minister in Victorian times who met Wagner and Liszt. He says in his later autobiography about his earlier journalism, I continued for some years to deluge the provincial press with columns of inflated bombast on a variety of topics, such as metaphysics, the position of women, and other topics about which I knew absolutely nothing. As I now look back on those scrapbooks full of articles, it's inconceivable to me how they ever got printed. But I always had the pen of a ready writer, and along with it, the common misfortune of having very little to say. Still, intellectuals do have some skills that it would be a pity to waste. So what should an intellectual with, so to speak, spare skills do or, and to look for an issue that he or she might contribute to? I'll tell you what I did. You see what you think. Uh, Twenty years ago, I knew very little about the indigenous affairs. I'd never been out there to those remote communities. I was just vaguely aware of the shocking statistics of indigenous Australians, especially remote ones, on health indices, lifespan, uh, education, violence, imprisonment and so on. Then in the year 2000 I saw the Harbour Bridge Warp for Reconciliation where an amazing 250,000 people walked over the bridge happily waving hands. I thought to myself, this is bullshit. <laughs> Those people don't want to know what's really happening out there. They want, just want to feel good about themselves. 
Of course, I'm re reading into their minds. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's not the case. After that, there was a rash of acknowledgements to country, and I thought everybody acknowledging the elders and so on. I thought this is this is not getting anywhere. It's acting as a smokescreen. It's like when I was a kid and we used to stand at the cinema and sing "God Save the Queen." You gave yourself a little tick because you observed the civic pieties, but it didn't mean anything for action. At the same time, I happened to read an article in the Medical Journal of Australia, 1997, called Malnutrition and Microcephaly in Abor Australian Aboriginal Children. It's what it says. It's about uh, children in Royal Darwin Hospital. They've got tiny heads uh, because, because of malnutrition before birth. A lot of fetal alcohol syndrome where children were assaulted in the, room. I thought, in, in the womb. I thought, what's going on here? Well, why, why, isn't, why don't we all hear about this? And to ignore that and engage in feel-good walks and ceremonies is, uh, well, the kind of thing you expect from intellectuals, but it's not moral. Then I found it suspicious that the discourse on this topic is all in high-flown Latin and Greek abstract vocabulary. Everybody's talking about recognition of sovereignty, intergenerational trauma, self-determination, reconciliation, the impact of colonialism, models of service delivery provisions. That sort of colourless polysyllabic language acts as a smokescreen. What's really happening is people hitting one another and dying early. Next thing I saw was a carry-on about the rate of Indigenous deaths in custody without any inquiry as to whether it was more or less than the white rate. And so on. I felt that I was being assaulted by an avalanche of misselected factoids. Well, so what? That's all very well to think it's rubbish out there, but I still didn't know what was really happening. But I said, well, I'll just keep an eye out. And it was a bit of an intellectual challenge. Maybe a little arrogantly, I thought that with a background in philosophy and the evaluation of historical evidence, I should be able to do better than the average uh, activist or commentator. Then, by coincidence, I met a remote area nurse, Janice Waring, who had spent years dealing with the extreme medical conditions of remote communities. She told it like it was, persistent family violence, grog abuse, forced marriages of 13-year-olds, dysfunctional health behaviours and malnutrition, kids unable to concentrate at school because they've been in a crowded house that's noisy all night. Then Janice and I went to a talk by Bess Price, a full-bodied Walpuri woman from Yunnabu in the central desert. Uh, she experienced serious violence in early life, and she has vast numbers of relatives who have that done as well. She said the same things and demanded that Aboriginal people have the same rights to freedom from violence as other Australians. She says that dysfunctional culture has to change, especially in rejecting traditions of violence. I felt I was finally getting a coherent and complete and true story. Well then, what am I, as a Sydney intellectual, uh, going to do about it? It didn't really make sense for me to become a self-proclaimed expert and give talks and write. I don't have the credibility of first-hand experience, so it's my job to support those who do, like Bess. When I took these actions, I'll list what I did over the last 15 years or so. Well, I did write a few things, but accounts of experts, uh, summaries of what other experts said, such as an article called The Cultural Roots of Indigenous Violence, which is about an anthropologist who visited Mornington Island over decades and observed the community's descent from reason, uh, reasonable conditions in mission days to violence and grog since 1970. I set up a website called Australian Database of Indigenous Violence just to collect the ongoing stories of extreme violence out there. White on black, black on white, but mostly black on black. It's not, the website is not about the causes or policies to fix it, it's just to report the facts. That's partly driven by my agreement up to a point with Hobbes's political philosophy, which says that restraint of violence is the first thing you need before you can start on other things like education, health, and so on. I foresaw that there could be some complaints of racism about this. Of course, I think that on the other hand, it's racist to suppress those facts. So I made sure the database didn't live on a UNSW server, and I didn't put my name on it, though I did make it possible to find what it was mine with an internet search. And I supported Stephanie Jarrett, who, in her writing this book, uh, Liberating Aboriginal People from Violence. And I threw her a book launch and uh, flew Best Price down to give a speech. When Best Price stood for election in the Northern Territory Parliament in 2012 and ran out of money, I sent her some. And not enough to make me poor, especially because I've 
been in receipt of a professorial salary for some years and I also had a legal success with my late mother-in-law's complex will. Bess was, select, well, Bess was elected and she became a minister in the Northern Territory Government but unfortunately the government was totally shambolic and they didn't get much done before they were turfed out after four years. I helped set up a Best Price Foundation which didn't go so well but the money has usefully gone to someone who does abuse prevention education in remote community schools. Now Best Price's daughter uh, Jacinta Price has taken up the political fight after being energised by the abuse her mum uh, copped and I've been supporting her. The latest is I may have to fork out for a defence of a defamation case from someone who wants to shut her down. Well that's what I would, that's what I did, what would you do? Thank you. Um, so now, uh, um, I'd like to call it a bit of a back and forth between you both. Uh, I'll start with Peter. Uh, I, sorry, I'll start with Jim, Peter. But, um, is there anything that, any point, any of the points that Peter made that you that you'd like to explore further, or that you'd like to push back on? Yeah. Well. Uh Totally. Um, as Peter knows, I have a somewhat more right-wing view and I'm not convi as convinced of the uh, criminal nature of uh, our government and American foreign policy or so on. But more to the point, I think, is that uh, American foreign policy and, let's say, the Palestinians or something are just issues that I'm not going to get into because I have no effect on those. And whatever I do, however much I learn, it's not going to have any effect. So I chose an issue where by, partly by coincidence, uh, I came to know some of the facts that most people don't know, and as it turned out, I could make a certain amount of impact, hopefully more impact uh, at second hand, as we go along. Can I just jump in? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I agree entirely. I think we agree. Your example is one that I might have given because you are confirming my distinction between the things where you can make a difference and where you can't. So on that, we entirely agree. Um, if I could generalise a little bit, the question of where you have a relevant expertise invites the further question, some areas you ought to acquire one or to acquire a relevant knowledge, and it's not quantum physics or mathematics where world affairs um, are not as deep and as complicated. You need to know stuff. It's not like you can be ignorant. But again, if I can quote uh, my usual favourite example, Chomsky's always criticised on the grounds of not having credentials or qualifications or relevant degrees in the areas he speaks about. And he makes fun of this when he comes here. <coughs> Some politicians said, what right have you to talk about it? And what expertise do you have? And he always answers the following way. He says, the same as the people in the political science department was Henry Kissinger, none. And the reason is that none is relevant because any 15-year-old, I'm quoting him, can understand world affairs. Now, that's a little bit cheeky and not quite fair. But it's, he's pointing to the difference between the depth of the social sciences. So that's one thing about when you have a, a appropriate credentials. The other case, and I can mention perhaps an example which somebody you, you know or you knew. Um, I remember when I was a student during the Vietnam War, uh, there was a rally at Sydney University and David Armstrong got up and made exactly that point. He said he has no view on this and doesn't say anything as a philosopher because he, it's not his area of expertise. I remember that vividly because that's exactly the same question. I think that was an unfortunate and, and inappropriate uh, answer. There are some things that we ought to know enough about because we are involved, our government is involved, and I think it's appropriate. Your example is a good one. You go your own case. That's an example where you became appropriately uh, qualified and you could do something. So, I mean, about the environment, about our going to wars, you can't protest that you don't know about them because you should know about them. These have enormous consequences and we can do something about it. Those were the criteria that I pointed to. So not being an expert is not uh, good enough as an excuse. If I can make one other uh, example of this. I had in my notes, I was going to cite uh, the famous uh, scholar of uh, Socrates and Plato, Gregory Vlastos. He has a rather uh, uh, discordant title for a paper, uh, Socrates and Vietnam. And he says that as a scholar, he uh, understood that uh, he has his duty to his studies as did Socrates. And although he says he's, Socrates is his great hero, he lapsed when there was Athens was going to war to some, somewhere else, and he didn't raise his voice on the grounds that his duty was to his philosophy. And Vlastos says during the Vietnam War, this was the dilemma he was faced with, and Socrates was less than noble for remaining silent 
And so the final encoding for him, you know, he was the greatest man we've known, deserves to be qualified silent. And it's exactly the same point. And uh, he quotes uh, the famous funeral oration of uh, Pericles. He says, we regard someone who takes no part in politics, not as one who sticks to his own business, but as a man who is good for nothing. And I have my favourite version of that, which is the Black Panther activist, Eldridge Cleaver. He says, you're either part of the solution or part of the problem. And that seems to me relevant in a lot of cases where we need to know and need to be involved. Yeah, well, that's true that you should, there's no point in criticising Chomsky or, for that matter, Donald Trump, that they don't have expertise. It's not that, ex, it's not that kind of technical expertise like in quantum physics that you need. But on the, it's, it's, still, it's still true that uh, foreign policy is not for people uh, Greta Thunberg's age, uh, maybe climate science either, but they, they're, they're, deep, they're not exactly deep, but there's a lot to know in, in working out what to think about, uh, let's say, Iran and Iraq and what, what appropriate policy is there. And uh, the, the many of the difficult things about international politics is uh, what's going to work in the circumstances because there's always a great deal of context. So uh, if while I'm not as critical as American foreign policy as Peter is, I certainly agree that there's a tendency in American foreign policy to rush in uh, where angels fear to tread without being uh, properly informed. That there's another view, I mean, on that. Yeah. If I could jump in on there that. The, the, the interesting question about relevant expertise uh, is the following. During the Vietnam War, to take that example again, the experts and the most liberal end of the Press expressed criticism of the war when they did, on the grounds that it was too costly, it was a quagmire, uh, even perhaps too many lives are being lost, maybe even too many Vietnamese lives. What's interesting is if you contrast with the lay people, the ordinary person in the street, they didn't read this anywhere, but they said something different. They said it was immoral, it was a crime. They got that on their own judgment from whatever they were able to see and think about. That's a very, it's one of the points I was going to make about the interesting contrast between the smart guys, the educated, and they're being locked into a certain paradigm. The New York Times, the most liberal criticism you can find in that period, won't say anywhere that this was a crime. I think many people now accept that it was. I don't think that's all that controversial. But that was an interesting reflection on the experts versus the ordinary folks, who have, again, Orwell's point. They can think more clearly about the moral issues. We maybe should remember that uh, many of the students at this university are children of the million people who fled Vietnam, Vietnam in the late 70s. Exactly. Uh, they, they were people uh, who fled the regime that was being fought against in the 1960s. Exactly. Well, that comes up in my classes, actually. So I've got a capstone class this semester. And we read Chomsky's papers from the 60s, exactly this topic, the responsibility I mentioned for intellectuals. And one of the interesting experiences for me was that, not every semester, but a couple of times now, we've had uh, Vietnamese students in the class who then come to me afterwards and say to me that, of course, they're children of the refugees from that period. So we have to talk about exactly that issue. Now, I think that's terrific that they've come and indicate that their background, and one of them, I think, said her father was a pilot in the South uh, Vietnam Air Force. The issue, which I think we can't avoid, is, I mean, even crudely, who are the good guys, who are the bad guys, but I don't think we can avoid that question. And yes, the Vietnamese are almost all refugees from the communist regime that kicked out uh, the Americans. That's a deep issue. Now, maybe it's far enough away in the past that we can talk about more dispassionately than what's going on today and where it's going on. That's another issue. But, yeah, we perhaps may differ as to what the rights and wrongs of that were. Uh, maybe we should have the audience maybe should give, it, give it a go. Uh, no, I, oh, do I, do wanna, I do want to say one more thing. Um, both of you brought up a different points of different social different social movements with regard to different social causes. You, of course, brought up the Marx reconciliation. You brought up protest in the Vietnam War. How do you think that you know people like yourselves, or just not only that, people with platforms, people with media, how do you think that they should behave in regards to large mass movements? Should they try to lead them in particular directions, or inspire them, or should they themselves be motiv like motivated by them in a more how, how would I say in a more observatory way? Everybody likes to be at the head of the crowd storming the Bastille, I suppose, but it's a, a temptation you should be a little careful of. You've just got to speak what you conceive to be the truth, given that you've uh, 
examine the issues properly, if people follow along, great. If they don't, well, too bad. Well, there's another side to it. I mean, uh, the public are often uh, vulnerable to the way in which the media and spokespersons, the intellectuals, present world affairs. If we talk in details, these are interesting cases, the Vietnam War, the Iraq involvement, Afghanistan, you name it. Another one that uh, we haven't got time to talk in detail, but I think of often as relevant to us, I ask my classes often about it, what about East Timor? What about Australia's, what I think is the sordid history in, in relation to East Timor? The question for you is, or the one that you ask is, what about the general public? It depends on what they are capable of finding out easily enough from the mainstream. The mainstream media simply lie. Or they, if they don't outright lie, they don't tell you relevant things about it. That's true in all of these cases that I'm interested in. You pick your favourite example. Uh, East Timor is a, a particularly interesting and relevant one for us. Uh, you can pick the Vietnam case or I don't know what's going on somewhere else in the world that uh, is relevant. The Iraq war. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people in that case were out in the street against it, but the mainstream media actually systematically distorted. So the question of what's the relationship to the public, I mean, Jim is right, you write articles, you get well enough informed and, and try to create some sort of balance. Uh, the mainstream media don't do it, not just the corporate media, the ABC I think is terrible on They're part of a system of uh, thought control in the West for, for systematic reasons which have been spelled out in detail. So we have a responsibility to create some sort of rational uh, uh, contrast. And it's not that difficult to go back to the question of expertise. It's not like it's difficult to, to find out, I mean, I haven't mentioned my own particular involvement, which in passing mentioned it. Um, I'm very deeply involved, as some of you all know, in the Israel-Palestine conflict. Now, the mainstream media just totally, egregiously misrepresent, systematically, what's going on there. Now, that's not as relevant to many of you as it is to me, perhaps, but that's an interesting case where it's a hot topic in international affairs. It's a wonderful case study in how the entire story that we all grew up with and continue to see is completely contrary to what are pretty much uncontroversial facts. So that's the issue that I'm raising. And Jim's example is a good one in the case of Aboriginal affairs. I, I agree with you entirely on that. There are other cases of that. So that's a kind of answer. We need to correct the, the imbalance. Right, thank you. Jim, you have any questions? Yeah. Um, uh, when, we, when we're talking about media, mainstream media, I, thought, I guess we should be thinking about whether things work differently with on Facebook and so on. Uh, it's, it's an issue, but I, I can't say I... Uh, have got anything useful to say about it. Things work differently, but in a, bad, in a different way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a lot of rubbish yeah. out there. There's yeah. no question about that and sorting that out. It's, people often ask me, you know, how do I know what to believe? It's a tough question. I don't know how to answer that. I mean, certainly in social media, I, I, to my sin, for my sins, I pay a lot of attention to people I follow on Twitter and on Facebook. I rely actually for a lot of my information for people that I rely on, that I regard as worth reading, articles they post and so on, uh, academics, journalists, activists around the world. Um, to some extent, there's the, the, the good side of that. I mean, but your point is exactly right. How do you sort out, uh, you need some guides, and there's no alternative to just thinking about it and trying to sort it out for yourself. Yeah. One, one thing about, that I will mention about social media, while Paul brought it up, social media does allow people to create their own narrative and maybe to broadcast to much more people than was traditionally possible, even through, like you know, the local run newspaper or you know through, I mean, through radio. Traditional mass, traditional medium of mass communication has always been, you know, has always had a barrier of, I mean, capital, influence, whatever you want to call it. That social media has, to a large extent, made that go away. So that just something I thought I'd add to what you just said. If I just add to it, the ABC is not corporate, it's public, you know, funded by the government, but an interesting example of how the, 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 the framing of the problem uh, can be seen, when uh, Michelle Guthrie was sacked by the then director, his reason was, it became explicit, whatever his name no, was. Just, Michelle Guthrie was the director of the ABC. Director, but I'm talking about the chairman of the board. Yeah. The chairman sacked her or was going to sack her, but it was interesting, he explained it on the grounds that he didn't want to upset the then Prime Minister. Turnbull, if I got that right. That's a very revealing thing for the public broadcaster to be thinking as their motive. Their job should be to upset the government. That's what, the, and I can go back to the Iraq War in 1991, which I followed very closely, the first Iraq War. Bob Hawke lost it and went nuts 
because the ABC dared to put on a commentator, an expert in that case, was Springboard from Macquarie University. But on the 7.30 report, every night he'd say something slightly critical of our involvement there. Bob Hawke was going to shut the ABC down. So the ABC is not exactly, uh, you know, as far to the left as it's, that's another trick of, of framing and constraining the boundaries of acceptable discourse. You're not allowed to think outside that framework because then you're off in cuckoo land on the left. The ABC is already too crazy. But actually, the ABC is part of the problem. They create a boundary to what you're allowed to think because it's already full of lefties. Well, that's bullshit. So, you know, public, and to that extent, social media, if you know and you can find alternative sources, it's not to believe the alternatives, but you've got to read contrasting accounts and then think about it. All right. Do you, do you have any answer? Yeah. All right. Let's, moment, let's hear from the people. The moment we're already waiting for audience questions. Um, anybody have any questions? Uh, we'll start down front here. So mine's less of a, well, it's just more of a pondering of the things that you guys have been saying. Um, thank you, it's triggered some interesting thoughts in my mind. I'm just wondering, um, Peter, you just mentioned about we're creating, we have this box that we live inside, and um, a lot of the things that you just said there are in that box, like the idea of, um, James, you mentioned that we shouldn't be trusting Greta Thunberg because she's too young or she doesn't have a, um, but, so we're, we're now saying that young people can't be trusted. Does that mean we should trust old people like Donald Trump um, in what he says? So, and then I feel like we're putting ourselves in that own box and saying, well, us as intellectuals, and I don't even like that word because I, I think that adds this thing that we're smarter than them, but I don't think we're smarter than anyone else. We just happen to have the, the, the certificate that goes with the years of education. But um, as academics or um, educated people, why do we presume that we hold all the knowledge or wisdom? Um, I mean, I don't know exactly whether what Greta Thunberg knows is accurate or not, but why would I trust her less or more than um, anyone else when we're, we're placing boundaries on who we should trust, such as academics or educated people um, versus, um, sorry, I've forgotten the, the Aboriginal lady's name, the best, um, I, 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 I don't know her, but was she educated? Is she educated in it? You, um, so she's not an intellectual, I, I'm guessing, and yet you put all your trust and faith in her to, to do these things, which I think is amazing. But, um, and anyway, I'm just going in a cyclical sort of uh, questioning yeah. here, sort of like where do we, how do we, why do we put ourselves in this box that then we're, we're obligated to, um, to push forward a, um, a, a stance or something um, when we're only, we're only adding to the box that exists? I started out by telling you not to trust the academics and intellectuals, <laughs> remember? Yeah. And uh, I trust the best price, so, yeah. because like, you, you can hear from what she's saying and it agrees with agreed facts about you know statistics of uh, hospital admissions in uh, uh, Central Australia yeah. and so on. So there's things that you can yeah. see that a story, some stories add up. And you can see that some stories mm -hmm. have deliberately left whole. Yeah. Uh, of course, you've got to take some work. You've got to pick up some actual facts as you go yeah. along. So, but you don't go around saying, well, okay, may, may, maybe I don't trust any 16-year-olds to know <laughs> anything much. But there's, but I don't trust people because they're old either. Right. There's no, there's no uh, kind of t uh, bop, um, features that call it, that tell me someone is trustworthy. Yeah. Uh, there, there is, there is well, it's well known. There's features that make you trust people, like people have a deliberate and slow, deep voice that helps them trust people. But right. it's got no relevance to right. actually trusting. You've got to look at the evidence and try yeah. to get past that. I'll just jump on in that. Look, I agree with Jim. Uh, it's actually not a matter of trust. You shouldn't trust anybody. But one of the most shocking experiences, no really, the, the most shocking experiences is to make the effort to read a view that's very contrary to your own. Not yeah. to believe it, but just read it. That has a very interesting effect. Um, so, I mean, I'll give you an example. The example I gave was I know better than most others, but the Israel-Palestine conflict. I often tell people, don't believe it, but just read one of the sources that I think are worth reading. And this Something about the truth that just speaks for itself. Because if you read this stuff, you're told a lot of stuff which really isn't controversial, but it's so contrary. I had this experience first when I first read Bertrand Russell, actually. He's one of the bad guys in that book. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think only for his personal life. I don't know whether he, I, I think he's one of the heroes, actually, in his political life. But one of the effects of reading him on anything 
was that he told you things that were such common sense, but nobody believed it. These, it was this effect of a, on a 16-year-old of sensible things that seemed transparently, obviously correct, and they were contrary to what the mainstream, what everybody seems to think. That's a very interesting experience to have, and in politics, when you read the alternative accounts, you make up your mind which sounds right. And I don't think, to go back to my point before, I don't think it's that difficult, actually. So, read. Uh, we, if I just add to it, again, in this class that I'm teaching, we read John Stuart Mill on, on Liberty, the second chapter two. And his advice is, of course, to protect the most outrageous, that's the lesson he actually makes, besides Socrates and Jesus, as the two dissidents that were put to death for their extreme opposed views. And he says, the people that put them to death were the good guys that had all the nationalistic, religious, and political uh, doctrines of the time. So read the most extreme opposite. And see what you think. Um, all right, just over, over here. Thanks. Uh, one thing that interested me listening to the discussion was <coughs> it's about the moral responsibility of intellectuals. But we never really asked what specifically we might mean by intellectuals, what would distinguish them from other people, and what would give them any special responsibility other than that of citizens. So one, I mean, there are tons, there's a huge controversy about the term, and in any Eastern Europe and Russia it has a special, and it gets it has a special meaning, but often, common to talks about intellectuals is that they're not experts. So not that they can't be experts, but their expertise is not the source of that name. They're people who have general views about things that they don't have an expertise on. Don't mean they're ignorant about them, but they don't get it simply through training. So what if and they're citizens, so they have the responsibility of citizens. What's special about them? Well they tend to write and to, to argue publicly about larger themes than what people and they have influence. And I think that uh, what, here I'm much closer to Jim than to Peter. One responsibility is the Hippocratic one, two and a half. And intellectuals, particularly in, as leaders of political movements, have done horrific hard because they have a kind of overweening confidence that they have a vision for which anything can be sacrificed. That was true of Lenin, it was true of Marx, it was true of uh, many, many revolutions. Uh, then think about what might be harmful because lots of things can sound good but we've seen some tragedies because people in the name of good have done terrible things. And then if you're lucky, try to redeem some, some hopes. They're not specific to intellectuals but intellectuals have a kind of specific position within the citizen. And I agree with Peter that intellectuals, people, must be critical. But that's not the same as subversive. Subversive might be, in certain circumstances, an appropriate thing right. to be engaged in. Is it a question? Yes, yeah, yeah. yes. Well, my question is, what do you think about all that? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with all that. But I think there is, I take, it, even though I criticise intellectuals so much in the, in the same terms that Martin has, uh, I think there is something to be said for the, the vocation, so to speak, of intellectual, that it's, it's desirable for reasonably intelligent people to think about quite a lot of things and uh, to, to move between one area and another and in principle to think about anything, though of course there are things you can't manage and you can't get across everything. But somebody has to think about how, how ex the silos of expertise relate to each other and how it should impact on policy. And there is a, a, a kind of overweening arrogance that, that you tend to get. So what we need is humble intellectuals. Uh, please name some for me. <laughs> uh, who will think about it and will be we will be critical. Yeah, it will be critical, but not necessarily subversive. Who who question everything, but a possible answer to the question has to be, oh well, it actually stacks up all right after all. Um, can I talk about that? Yeah, um, I just we'll try and keep our answers short because we want to get a few more questions. Sure, absolutely. Look, I agree with a lot of what Martin said. Um, your point about not doing harm is exactly my point. That there's some places where you can achieve that and not others. If I'm criticising China, not much I can do about it, but there's some places that make my point that your voice can have an effect uh, to prevent harm. I think it's fair to say, you may not agree with me, as, as I think I know, uh, Chomsky, I think his whole life has been precisely arguing, whether you agree or not, that the American uh, harm around the world was what he was trying to prevent. We could talk about the specifics, but 
his team or so on. So that I agree with. Your question about what's an intellectual is also a very good one. There's no clear definition, but your definition is one that I'll accept. It's generally referring to people who are educated. One of the virtues of the moral uh, responsibility is that we have the time, we have the skills, we can read. And that's my point about we should have some opinions about some matters where our voice makes a difference. So I, I agree with that. That's the, the, the class is broadly defined in terms of the education and the ability and the leisure that we have as opposed to the guy that works you know, all day in the coal mines. Um, they don't have the resources, both in time and leisure, and they're not capable, perhaps, of doing what we can do. Okay, um, just to you. Um, so if the responsibility of intellectuals is to tell truth and uncover lies, then is a person who is otherwise capable, um, that is silent or indifferent or complacent, acting moral, like in a morally irresponsible way? Like, if, yeah, so telling truth and uncovering lies is very much an active thing, but if they stay, like, I guess withdrawn are they being morally irresponsible? Yeah, remaining silent. Just lazy. Mm. Or, or, they're lazy, yeah, sure. That's the evil, that's the worst yeah. evils, but it's it's it's, it's, it's doing lazy. something wrong. No. But they're lazy. lazy. But they're like lazy or just given much as expected kind of thing. Or are they lazy or are they more more are they immoral as well? It's it's not just lazy if you don't speak out when you should speak out. That's much more seriously a, a moral lapse. And I, I qualified that. It's not just telling the truth. I made a point of saying that some truths are morally more important than others. It's, I can tell you the truth about Genghis Khan, who was a terrible guy, but there's no moral significance. That was my point about criticizing places where one has arguably zero impact. And the point is that that's the fashion, that's the tendency of our intellectuals. They pick on the bad guys that are unquestionably the bad guys. Lenin, you pick all of the terrible people in the world, there's no question. I wouldn't, it's not a question of defending them. But let's look, that book by Johnson doesn't pick, you know, the cases where uh, they deserve criticism because they're endorsing terrible things that we're doing. All right. Thank you. Uh, maybe here. I don't really think, I don't really think about what you're saying about intellectuals need to be subversive, but I thought I'd ask a question relating to that. Um, do you think that, is that, if you say they need to be subversive, does that mean that, um, that there's no real place for intellectuals to also be, you know, loving of the home or loving of the oikos, as Scruton put it, you know, Roger Scruton. Um, I thought. Yeah, I read that by Scruton. Yeah, you know, why, why, uh, why intellectuals not allowed to be, you know, dissenting to the progressive um, consensus that there seems to be in the academy? Aren't they? Like, isn't there heaps of people like that? Yeah, they don't get you mainstream just publication. You just mentioned. True, true. I mean, they're not popular, I should say. Yeah, well, they, uh, we need to hear from people who have some different conclusions. Roger Scruton was uh, certainly one of the best known intellectuals in the world. Worked for him. Uh, May, or true, he's in a minority, but still, we can congratulate our society at least that we, uh, he, he survives out there. And he, well, like he survived out there, and you could read what he said if you felt like it. It won't be too long with this, but I guess the point I'm trying to make is that you know, for every scrutiny who's maybe like, you know, your acceptable conservative, should I say, you know, there'd be like 50 different people doing, you know, a gender studies uh, professorship or like a, you know, being another Chomsky, well, Chomsky I respect, but I mean like there's a lot of people, like 50 other people being progressive and then there's one person being conservative. It just seems that there's a, I don't know, it just seems like there's not 50 people. You think there are more progressives than conservatives among intellectuals? In, in, in the academy, the academy. There are I doubt that. Yeah. Well, Depends on what you mean progressive. This is yeah. a question how you define. Well, I mean subversive to the power structure, the whole thing about yeah. being, you know, um, okay, well, home is what we need to preserve, uh, criticize, you know, like the, the social structure is what we need to criticize, not, um, you know, be reinforcing or, or be allowed to defend, I don't know. Well, there are, certain, there, are, there are, of course, studies in those United States, states of the United States where voter registration is, uh, the data is available, and they look at the voter registration of social science departments in universities, and uh, it's fair to say there is a certain bias and that there are a number of Republican voters is uh, minimal. <laughs> um, any more questions? Uh, yeah. um, apropos your comment about the Vietnam War, just 
I'm really sort of not concerned about how intellectuals can recognise anti-intellectuals. And what I read, what I recognised at the time of the Vietnam War was that there were people from Poland, Ukraine, you know, Hungary, Czechoslovakia who suffered from the ravages of communism, but and they were very wary of um, not getting involved in the Vietnam War. As a child, I remember hearing these discussions. The best thing we can do for our beloved Australia is spare them from this scourge of communism. So we should go and fight them. And yet, in other places, I heard the opposite view. As you said, there was another mainstream view of poor migrant workers who maybe didn't speak English very well, who really did support the Vietnam War. But what I found was, in discussion, it was fairly reasonable. There were no shouting matches. I mean, you would think a lot of these East Europeans would be ready to pick up arms and scream and so on. No, there was there was really quite rational discussion of opposing points of view. And I'll never forget that, that that was what made me even love the country even more. I mean I was born here, but you know, when I heard adults discussing it. So uh, when I now what I see is a loss of that rational discourse, that you see people aroused by emotion so quickly. Um, whether they're intellectuals or whether they're the ordinary panel on the street or whatever. Um, and you don't get this kind of calming, like listening to you two speak, very calming, you hear, consider. But once you get that kind of screaming and ranting, and I think that's what people object to in. Um, that's the something. screaming and ranting, who are you referring to? Oh, there are people who can become extremely angry at a particular point of view, say, um, Watch Q and A sometimes. You'll just get constant <laughs> barrage of. I mean, I, don't, I like watching it occasionally, you know, for the exchange. Of you. Sometimes it's um, everybody's with one point of view and just repeating it in so many ways. Can we somehow teach the elements of rational discourse at a high school level? You know, listening to the opposite point of view. What you said, Peter. You know, that this is really important to be able to listen calmly to a different. To be able to say this is what you're saying and this is what I'm saying. Do you know how difficult that is? Look, in some cases when things are serious enough and bad enough, certainly getting emotional and upset is appropriate. And we can pick examples we might agree on, but I can think of a few where the atrocities and the crimes are on such a scale that if you're conscious of it, it's a kind of an emotional response to it. The interesting question is how you deal with that. And my difficulty has been in my own political activism is talking to people who are diametrically opposed and who who are very emotionally committed uh, to the other side. And it's very difficult to have a rational conversation. It, it varies. With some people who disagree diametrically, you can. With others, you can't. You get a lot of abuse from some people, and you can't have a, even old friends. I mean, I, an interesting history and all this. There's some old friends that I, I can't talk to about things we disagree about, and others, surprisingly, who disagree really quite seriously. Yet we can have a conversation to try and sort it out. It's very difficult, and it's not a question of not being emotional about it, it's how to change people's minds really in the end. I, often, I used to say this to Jim, we've debated quite often, and one topic or another, I used to say to him, look, you know, we're both trying to do this rationally and with goodwill and so on. One of us is wrong and the other one, and we should give up and to go to the other side. I mean, that's kind of a joke, but it's kind of true too. You know, in some cases, the two Can't sides are right. Yeah, yeah, one of us is wrong and yeah. we should change sides. Yeah. That's yeah. not possible usually. That's right, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, rational debate has, has gone off a bit. There are, there are shocking pylons on uh, you know, social media, and controversial figures like Bill Leak on one side and Yasmin Abdul Magid on the other get extraordinary levels of abuse and uh, death threats and so on. Just into price too. Best, it's yeah, you have to have a hide like a rhinoceros to keep going through all that, and it's, it shouldn't happen. All right, um, do we have any final questions? Sue, how did you evaluate your impact on the Indigenous affairs issue or in your paper on uh, the uh, immorality of drug testing welfare recipients over you know, your um, moral responsibility to work on a different matter? Yeah, uh, well, a anything I've written and said on these things has had, I think, zero impact. Mm -hmm. I've had a, the, the, the money has had a bit of impact in that uh, Jacinta Price is still, still there. Uh, she'll, be, she'll be standing at the next election, I think. 
best I can do. Um, have you any questions here? Uh, <clears throat> I was just, uh, there was some discussion about, um, you know, not speaking unless you're well informed and you, that you have some responsibility to know what you're talking about. But it seems to me we live in an age now where uh, you have extreme examples of people talking about things they know nothing about. So in a sense, don't, doesn't the intellectual, whatever that means, have even more responsibility to perhaps, you know, enter the debate because on the face of it they know much more than some well, It's people. not enough to know much more. You've, you've got to know enough to be convinced you've got the right answer, to be reasonably convinced you've got the right answer. So it's the like the standards, know much. That standard's a very uh, hard one to judge, I would imagine. Yeah, but if we all, <laughs> there'd be a lot less crap about if everybody Gone yeah. for that standard. But given that you've got a substantial portion of the people who are going to adopt that bar and they're possibly going to cause enormous damage in the process, don't you then have more of a moral responsibility to, to come out with what you do? Not if you not if you there's no point in going off half cocked and on social media or something, complaining about people who know even less than you do. To be half, to be half informed is not to be in a good position. Yeah, if you, if you are in that position, you should <laughs> shut up and uh, find somebody who was who was properly informed in your view and support them. It's a matter of degree. If I can give an example of your point, um, I have an old friend like we grew up together, and uh, we argue a lot about it. And he's uneducated and doesn't know much about the topics we argue about. He has the strongest dogmatic opinions about things uh, which he knows nothing. And it, he, his, his strength of opinion is inversely proportional to how much he knows. <laughs> well, this is an interesting problem because, you know, he doesn't defer, I mean, I'm asking him to defer to me exactly, it's not that, but you can't have a conversation because he's not going to read stuff that I've read. Look, I don't know how to answer that one, that's a tough one. And, and uh, a lot of people like that, so look, it's, there's no one pattern here. People, different people react differently, and uh, some people recognise that I had another conversation with a friend just yesterday who said to me, yes, of course, I know more about this particular topic than he does, and he asked me what he should read. But that's a different attitude. Uh, that's, that's the best you can hope for. All right. Um, did I miss any questions about the end? Um, just, this might be our last one. Actually, no, just... teacher at the university has a responsibility not to show their political or other biases in the class? Yeah, especially yeah, it's a good question. Like in like a snide or sort of like invalidating way, constantly. It's a very good question. Yeah. If I could just quickly say, I confront this all the time for various reasons. I teach different courses. I usually, the current course I'm teaching, I mentioned, a capstone course, is the only one where political issues come up because we read these sorts of things I mentioned and the Vietnamese student that came on, this makes it an interesting test case for how to handle where there's going to be some difference, quite deep difference. But let me give you another example where it has come up for me, and I'm rather pleased with how it's gone over the years. I used to teach a course on the philosophy of religion, and I'm an atheist, and I didn't hide that. On the contrary, I did what I think is the Socratic thing. I provoked the class by giving them, not just my point of view, but giving them, of course, the best readings on their side. And if I can pat myself on, on the back, <laughs> The campus Bible study Christians were one of the largest groups that came to my class. They sent one another along, and I was very proud of that. <laughs> because they came for all the right reasons. They've got a sort of a funny reputation on campus, but I admired them, and I, they were terrific students. Because they came, they wanted to hear the arguments, and 
I did it as intellectually and respectably as possible. I gave them the best arguments, better ones than they knew they got from their church on Sunday. I gave them all the, you know, the ones that you'd know, Plantinger and William Lane Craig, and they set me up in a big public debate many years ago with the leading guy in the town hall. So that was a good example of where, partly it's personality, but I don't think one teaches better by pretending not to have a view, because I think that's sort of cheating the students actually. I put it up front on the table and encourage them. Of course, I joke that, look, I fail atheists as easily as I fail people who disagree with me. I mean, I'm joking. <laughs> the point was that agreeing with me is not the point, and I'm not trying to just bludgeon people into sharing my views. I don't, I don't care what they think, really. It's, we went through the arguments, and it was terrific. So, so I don't believe myself that good teaching necessarily requires not having or not showing your view, provided you deal with your students in an appropriate way, respectfully, and, and uh, they don't feel inhibited from expressing. I struggle with a little bit in the political case. I always make a little speech at the beginning of the, the semester, saying, look, these are controversial issues. And, and I've been rather pleased. We've had extreme right-wing guys that disagree with everything I said. They set up a class Facebook, the anti-Chomsky uh, <laughs> website. So, so, so look, uh, I, I think I'm doing it as well as I can. Yeah, I think that's that's the right way to go if you're dealing with a controversial issue. Of course, I haven't had this issue teaching uh, linear algebra much. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's controversial, it's boring. Um, any, any, any other questions? Sorry, I had one more question for James. You, your um, uh, position on helping um, Bessie, was it Bessie? Beth Price. Beth, Beth Price, Beth. sorry, Beth Price. Um, was that as, did you feel obligated to make that contribution as a human being or as your role as an academic or intellectual? Well, in the first instance, as a human being, but uh, there was a role for, for my kind of intellectual skills in think because it was so, there's so, so many competing views in this area, it's, it's one where it's very hard, hard to think straight. And uh, I have to dis, have to work, I, ha, I found it intellectually very difficult to work out who was talking sense and who right. wasn't. Yeah, okay. So you felt that with your skills you were able to siphon the information and then be able to present it in a logical and informal manner? Well, yeah, in, in the first instance, to work out who was talking sense, that yeah. he was being rely talking reliably, giving me the correct picture of what was happening in an area that I didn't know about. Okay. Right. Uh, well, oh, just here. Um, I mean, more on a, on a practical level, um, speaking about us, well, us, intellectuals speaking up in um, in contexts where we can make an impact. Um, in those situations, is our moral responsibility to pursue the option that we think is the best one, or the option that we think has the most chance of success? How are they different? Mm -hmm. yeah. what? I'm coming at it uh, very much from a social policy um, point of view, so things that can go through government and be passed as laws, more things that are more palatable versus things that we think might be better. I'm not exactly. sure I can't get, get what, where there'd be a contrast exactly. I mean, exactly. policy, well, policy, of course, is sort of <laughs> satisfying, and uh, you, maybe there's policies that are perfect but are not politically realistic or something. Well, maybe there's no point in pursuing them. But uh, if, if we're talking about you know, in deep policy on remote communities, uh, it's, I don't think there is this distinction exactly. Uh, something has to be done to make it safe for people out there. For what that is, we have to think about. But, uh, I don't see you're going to find a contrast between policy and perfection or something. Uh, yeah, we, we need an example just yeah. on what contrast you're thinking of. Um, the top of my head, maybe something like passing a tax break for um, childcare versus giving people the same benefit but in the form of a universal basic income. One of them has less chances um, to, uh, be implemented. to be implemented in the next five years, possibly, um, versus the other that could be done fairly 
quickly, but might not have the same kind of long-term impact that what the, um, the universal basic income might have. Well, these these are control. policy questions that are too confusing for a simple abstract intellectual like me. <laughs> <laughs> I do philosophy in pure maths, you know, and history of ideas. I can't handle policy. <laughs> what a terrible answer. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, I'm not sure it's close to your example, but I was thinking of, of the notorious now argument that Australia shouldn't uh, do much about its um, uh, carbon dioxide emissions because we're only one point something percent. Mm -hmm. Is that an example? And it's there's a sort of a pragmatic argument as opposed to a principle argument. Well, that's nothing. Yeah, the, the whole uh, carbon pricing is off the table because it's just not going to get um, whoever puts it forward elected, even though that might be a, a good option. Like, what is is the point to have something done or to have the best solution? Tim, that's a tough one. Unless you look at specific cases. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, sort of policy is about being realistic, but uh, you know, that's, that's I don't think intellectuals are that good at working out of being, being realistic in that particular sense. So you have to leave that to policy makers and the numbers men in the back rooms, I suppose. I don't know. And this is a case where the term realistic is, oh, there's the pejorative term, real politic, where often an excuse for doing something immoral is that it's a real politic, meaning that's just how things are. Mm -hmm. And the principled answer is somehow too idealistic and so on. In those cases, examples of that, that's often a case where you're arguing for an immoral uh, position because it's practical or it's, so that's an interesting contract, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, so, so we'll um, have some refreshments uh, downstairs, perhaps uh, some locals could uh, lead the others to, to mm -hmm. the common room. Um, yeah, alright, uh, so just, uh, just want to thank Sean firstly for helping uh, organise today and in being here, I just want to thank Jim and also Peter um, for all their time, and I just want to thank everybody who came and asked questions and listened. Um, thanks very much for coming. So thank you. <laughs>